Hello, I'm Jacob Beningo, an embedded software consultant, and today I'm going to walk you through my second video on MicroPython. In this video, we're going to look at the MicroPython build system itself and figure out how we can build MicroPython and then deploy it onto a development kit of our choice. In this particular case, I'm going to show you how to build it and deploy it onto a Netduino 2 Plus. This is an Ethernet enabled board. You can see right here, we have an Ethernet on board, we have micro USB, we have a micro SD card. We also have the original microcontroller that the MicroPython port was originally developed for, which is an STM32405RG. And then as you can see here, this particular board is very interesting because it also meets the Arduino R3 pinouts. So this means that we can have not only MicroPython running on a development kit, but we can also go out and get Arduino shields and then start building and matching systems for rapid prototyping. Now, in order to first start out before we compile the system itself, what we want to do is very quickly explore the MicroPython directory structure. As you can see here, we have some a couple of files that might be of interest to you, um, some basic code conventions for the actual code base, uh, a freeware open source license, and then a readme file. The readme file actually has some very interesting and useful information about MicroPython. I would highly recommend that you take a look at it if you're planning on building MicroPython yourself. Some of the other folders here, as you'll see, there's a documents directory. There is also a couple of different directories for different microcontroller architectures. As you can see, MicroPython can be ran on just kind of a, a bare ARM processor. It can be ran on a TI uh, CC3200 microcontroller, an ESP8266. There's also even a PIC16 port for the system as well, uh, one for the Teensy. And then the one that we're really going to be looking at today, which is probably the most supported MicroPython port, is going to be for the STM32 microcontrollers. Let's take a look at what we have to do in order to actually build MicroPython. We'll start by going into the STM HAL directory. Now, as you can see in this directory, there is quite a bit going on in this directory. Lots of different files that we're taking a look at here. Now, one of the things that we're going to do if we want to just build MicroPython for the first time, we probably want to deploy on a development kit that is already off the shelf and already supported. Now, in order to find out what boards are actually supported by MicroPython, there's this boards folder that we can go into. And if we do that, what we find is that there's a whole bunch of boards already previously supported. So what I can do, I can go in if I wanted to and take my Nucleo F401RE board, and I could compile for that particular board, and then I'll have all my MicroPython features associated with that particular board. There's also the PYB, boards. These are the Pi board, which is the original development kit for working with MicroPython offered through the MicroPython organization. That's actually a great starter kit. A lot of times we're probably not going to be building that default directory for that board ourselves. We're either going to do it for a different development kit or deploy it on our in target hardware. There's also an STM32 discovery board for the 429 and there's also one for the 430, uh, 439 and then a generic F4 and F7 uh, distributions as well. So one of the things that I would recommend is that you go through these and you pick a board that is already been developed for. Then you can go out and we can do just a simple build and deployment of MicroPython on the board. Once you've gone through that process once or twice and you get familiar with it, then it makes a lot of sense to then go and start to create your own hardware and then customize the MicroPython build for your particular purposes. So let's start now by going through and actually figuring out how can we compile MicroPython. Now, we're just going to use the compiler that we installed in the first video. So all we have to do is type make and then speci specify the board that we want to actually compile for. So in this case, I'm going to say board is equal to, and I select my development kit. If I was doing it for an STM 439, I could just type STM 32 F439. That's going to associate with this particular folder and this particular board. In this case, as I mentioned earlier, I want to deploy this on a Netduino plus two. So I'm going to type here instead Netduino plus two. And what this is going to do is it's going to go into the Netduino plus two directory and it's going to use those configuration options in order to build MicroPython. And we'll talk about what those specific differences are uh, a little bit later in this video. For now, we'll just go through and we'll let the system start to build. All 
right, so now we finally got to the end of our compilation. Once again, approximately one to two minutes worth of time. Not a very long build process. If we were successful, this is the output that we're going to see. We should see the ARM compiler tell us what the text data, BSS, and total size is for our, our file. It's also going to tell us where it stored it at. So you'll see here we'll end up inside of our STM HAL folder. Uh, we're going to end up with a build NetDuino plus two folder. And then inside that file folder, we're going to end up with a couple different things. We're going to end up with an ELF file. We're going to end up with a DFU file and then a hex file. The DFU file can be used to deploy our MicroPython build over the built-in USB bootloader included in the STM32 microcontrollers. If instead we didn't want to use the USB DFU, we could actually go and download ST-Link utilities, and then we could use the ST-Link to load the firmware.hex file. I'm going to walk you through most of the steps required to actually do it using the DFU for this particular development kit. As I mentioned, we can find these files. We're going to see if I actually do an LS of my STM HAL directory. We can see right here, here's the build directory for that particular development kit. Before we go through and actually look at the details of how we install this onto a microcontroller, let's go instead and take a look at what the different configuration files show us within the MicroPython code itself. So if you take a look at the NetDuino Plus 2 folder underneath the boards folder, you're going to see that we have a couple of different files here. Uh, the first one is boardinit.c. This is going to be a file that specifies any target specific initializations that need to be done on the board. So for example, with this particular NetDuino Plus 2 board, we have some power rails that we might want to enable and be able to look at. So if I jump in here, we can see here that there's some early initialization function that gets called. It's going to set up some basic initializations for some GPIO. And then it's also going to go through and it's going to turn on the 5 volt expansion header so that we automatically get 5 volts on our development kit. That way we don't have to go in in our script and automatically turn it on ourselves. So any board specific initializations that we want done, we could put into this particular uh, file. Now we also have some other folders here. Pins.csv is going to specify what the different pins are. So once again, we can go in here, take a look at what the pin definitions are. As you can see on this development kit, we can use then uh, D0, D1, D2, and it specifies what these different settings are and what pin they are associated with within the development kit. So you can see here that it, LED is associated with uh, PA10. So I can use the LED specifier within the MicroPython code and just refer to it as LED. Same thing if I want to adjust I.O., I can uh, use D0 as a specifier there as well. So I could go, go, go in and put up and assign names and pins inside of that folder if I were to port this from scratch. We also have a make file, and then we have uh, an mpconfigboard.h file. Now this is the one that's going to be a little bit more interesting for us. Each board is going to have its own capabilities. Now this particular file is based off of that Pi board that was developed by the MicroPython organization. So as you can see here, we can give our board a name. So in this case, I'm deploying to the NetDuino Plus 2. But if I was customizing this, I could go in and change this and make this Jacob's board. And then I would, when I actually go into my MicroPython, inside the terminal when it loads, it would say Jacob's board there, instead of the typical NetDuino Plus 2, naming the hardware and then providing the version number. So there's some control there. If I, for example, have a development kit where I don't have any push buttons or switches, I could come in here and set this value to false. If I don't have an accelerometer on board, then I can come in here and set this to false. If I have an SD card on board, I could go in and set this value to a 1. As you can see here from the specifier, the NetDuino Plus 2 board does actually have an SD card on it, but it's using a different type of chip than was typical with the Pi board. So there's extra work that has to be done in order to get that SD card to work properly with MicroPython. So the default setup for the NetDuino Plus 2 board is for the SD card to actually be disabled. But as you can see here, we could walk through this file and you'll see that there's different things that we can go in and set up. We can specify which UART we want uh, to be specified. We have different hardware pins. So we can go in and specify the different buses and capabilities that are associated with our particular microcontroller that we're using to deploy MicroPython onto. So at that point, that really gives us probably the majority of the capabilities of what we're interested in to configure. Um, we could also go into the HAL configuration file. For all our purposes, it's not terribly interesting. So I recommend that you browse through that particular file on your own. Now, one of the things that we're going to want to do, now that we've kind of looked at how we can configure the board itself, 
compile it, now we're going to want to look at how we can actually deploy this using the DFU tools. Now one of the first things that we're going to want to make sure that we actually do is that we actually have the DFU utilities installed on our system. So if you haven't ever installed the D DFU utilities, you can do this really easily. You just do sudo apt-get install and then we say DFU util, hit enter, enter in your password for root privileges and then it's going to go through and it's going to download the DFU utilities. As you can see, I've already installed them on my particular uh, development environment. So it's just telling me that there, it's already installed. It's the latest version. There's no need to upgrade. If you hadn't installed it, you'll find that there's about 30, 232 different files that are going to be installed on your system. Once you've gone through and you've done this, we now have the ability to update our firmware on our development kit. But there is going to be something that we need to do. We need to create a micro dev rules file. So what you're going to want to do is do a sudo nano go under the etc folder microdev rules.d and then we're going we could specify a particular development kit um, there's an example on the micro python git repository of how you set up these rules they all show the board being the rule being for the the 49 discovery board um, and then they do a dot rules at the end so it's 49 hyphen stm discovery dot rules so if you were to actually go and do that, what you would find, you had to create this file first, but then you're going to find that you have an empty file. So there's a bunch of information that you're going to have to go in and add in order for the DFU utility to be able to identify the discovery board. Uh, this is all the information that you have to enter in in order to make this work. It's a lot of uh, different strings you have to put in here to make it work properly. The best way to go about doing this to get this file correct is either go to the micropython.org website and follow their rules for updating firmware on the STM32F4 discovery board, or you can also go to my website, which is www.beningo.com, so B as in boy, E-N-I-N-G-O. Uh, in the search bar, just do a search for MicroPython, you'll find that there was a course that I did for Design News. Go to the Design News CEC course on MicroPython. I have some files that can be downloaded, and it includes this rules file. That way you don't have to set that up yourself. So all you would do then is take the file, the 49 stm discoverys file, and you would copy it into etc. microdev rules.d folder, and then you'd be able to run the DFU utilities and have it recognize your development kit. So once you've gone through and you've done that, you saved your file, we exit out, we want to make sure that we reload the dev rule. So we're going to want to do a sudo microdev adm, do a control, reload, rules. So as you can see there, I actually made an initial mistake. I forgot one of the hyphens. It gives me an error. We actually want to have hyphen hyphen reload rules. And then it will go through, it will update the rules, and we will be now ready to start to update our embedded system. Now, in order to update our particular NetDuino Plus 2 development kit, what we're going to want to do is push down on this press button and then we're going to want to plug in the micro USB connector. Now by pressing and holding it during the power up sequence, what we're going to be telling the microcontroller is that we want to boot up in the DFU bootloader. So I press down the button and then plug in my NetDuino Plus 2. What I'll find is that I now have the ability to connect my bootloader to my development environment. Once I've gone through and I've done that, I should be able to go in and start loading the code onto my development kit. So I can say a DFU util, and I can do a list to make sure that my kit is actually showing up. As you can see, in this particular case, it's showing me that it has not been able to find my particular development kit. So as it turns out that if you're running a VM on Windows, there seems to be a possibility where for some reason uh, my virtual machine is having an issue connecting to my NetDuino development kit. Uh, so one of the things that I did was I went through and on my Mac I created a, a new virtual machine, followed the exact same steps to set everything up. I was able to have no problems connecting the NetDuino Plus 2 to my Linux distribution with it in bootloader mode. And then I, once you perform the simple command where you do a DFU hyphen util, create a list, what you'll find is going to be something that looks 
just like this. You're gonna show it's gonna show that hey, I found the DFU. It's gonna list a couple of different ports, different configurations, but it is going to have a device ID associated with the device that it found. Now, if you go back to your rules file, what you're gonna discover is that these exact same DF11s and some of these different uh, characters here, we actually put all of those in that rules file so that would be able to identify our development kit. So what we're going to do then is we're going to start up the DFU util. We'll say DFU util, do a dash A, a zero. We're going to type 0483, which is our device ID with the DF11, a dash D, then do build Netduino. So we're specifying the folder here that we want to access, which is going to be the, the uh, Arduino plus two. And then we're going to say firmware.dfu. Now, when we actually run this, we want to make sure that we're not in the boards folder. We actually want to do that from the STM HAL folder. If I do this, it's going to say it's not able to find the particular folder. I go up one directory, I re-execute, and it's then going to go ahead and say um, that's able to connect. Now, in this case, as I mentioned, this particular environment in which I set up is having a hard time identifying my development kit. Uh, so it's saying that it can't find a DFU capable USB device. If you are using a system that isn't having problems accessing the DFU utilities, what you'll find is something that looks just like this. Um, so you're going to see that it says, hey, we're running DFU, it supports up to version 1.0. It's going to open the DFU device, show the ID. It's going to put it basically into its bootloader mode, claim the interface. And then as you can see here, it eventually gets to the point where it starts imaging the system. This is gonna take a few minutes while it parses out. So it's gonna say, hey, parsing element one. And it's gonna sit there for a while and it's gonna look like it's potentially hung, hung up. Uh, it's not, it's still working. Then it's gonna say parsing element two. Eventually it will say that it's done. At that point, once it's done, you are actually then able to restart your system and you should have MicroPython running on your development kit. Once you've gone through and you've programmed your development kit with MicroPython, one of the best ways to verify that it's actually working the way you expect it to is to plug the development kit in, connect it to your virtual machine, and what you should find is that, hey, look, my development kit is showing up as a Pi board virtual COM port. That's good, that's how I get my Pi terminal up. So I can go ahead and connect that. In order to verify that my MicroPython port is working successfully, one of the things that I can do is I can connect the board to a computer, verify that it shows up as a flash drive, and then verify that I'm also able to then open a terminal and connect to the device, get the Python terminal, then I can try to control some LEDs, uh, do a LED on, LED off, and what I should find is that my development kit is working and functioning uh, just like the Pi board from the MicroPython organization. At that point, I'm then ready to either go in and start customizing the MicroPython port or simply using Python on my development kit. I appreciate your time and attention, and I hope that you found this helpful.